Hello everyone. Welcome back to Wing Leader Flight Training with me, Evil Dr. Ganymede. And today we are going to start a new scenario in which I will be demonstrating some new concepts from the game. In this case, I'm not going to be playing through the whole scenario from start to finish because I did that with birthday present in the previous few videos so that you could see how the basic things like tallying and air combat and movement worked. But we don't need to go through all that in so much detail here. So what I'm going to do is play through the scenario, but we'll actually show you the parts that are relevant to the concepts that I'm going to be introducing. So those concepts are wings and wing leaders, tactical flexibility and escorts. And this is from scenario V24, which is called Operation Flax. We are now in Tunisia in 1943. We have the allies on the right here, actually Commonwealth. This is 211 group. And there is a wing made up of the South African Air Force here in Kitty Hawk planes, which are P-40F Warhawks. They're actually American planes. So once again, we're using American planes in a different nation here. So these are more advanced versions of the Warhawks that we were using in Birthday Present. And they are accompanied by a squadron of Spitfire Mark Vs, which are flying ahead of them. And those are tactically flexible. And opposing them are a formation of SM-79 Sparviero bombers. In this case, this particular scenario, these are actually transport. So you can see on their wing display that they have transport missions. That's the same as a bomber, except they cannot ever drop their bomb load. Their bomb load is their cargo. That's what's slowing them down. So they are still armed, however. They're not completely defenseless or anything, but they just can't drop bombs. And they have two escort squadrons, which are these MC-202 Fulgores or Fulgore. I think I'll just call them MC-202 and not Magnol the pronunciation. These are capable fighters. They're pretty similar to the Spitfire Mark Vs. So these are escorts. They're on an escort mission. And all of the Allied planes here are on intercept missions, which we saw before. You may also notice that we've got four squadrons or flights here in the Allied side, but we've only got two vector counters out. So that is partly because we have a wing here. So the thing with wings is that it's a group of squadrons under the command of a wing leader, which is this expert here. And the wing leader doesn't have to be the expert. The wing leader could be a separate pilot. And in the case of wings that are on intercept missions, the wing leader places the vector and then all of the other squadrons will move towards that vector in formation with the wing leader. So the thing about a wing is that it's a group of squadrons that are in formation, i.e. They're, they're adjacent to each other. And in this case, each of the squadrons is 12 planes and the flights are six planes. So this is actually two squadrons plus a flight. That's 30 planes in total. So this is a big group of planes. But to be considered a wing, they have to have a wing leader. It's basically like the next step up from a squadron. A squadron is a group of however many planes, 8, 12 planes. A wing is a group of two or more squadrons, essentially, that are flying in a formation. The other thing as well is that not all formations are wings. The Italians here are all flying in a formation, but that isn't a wing because there's no wing leader there. On top of that, they're on bombing missions and escort missions. And wings are generally intercept or sweep missions. So the wing is a big unit. If a squadron exits the formation or tallies somebody on their own, then it leaves the wing and it's not covered by the rules of being in a wing anymore. So I find the explanation for how wings work in the rulebook to be a little bit confusing. So I've tried to rephrase it here. So if 
A squadron on the same radio net as the wing tallies an enemy squadron, then that enemy squadron or any squadron in the same formation becomes a target for an order. In the tally phase, a wing leader can select any available squadron in the wing, including his own, and issue it an order. The squadron that receives the order automatically places its tally marker on an eligible target, no tally roll is required. That's the best way I could rephrase it to make sense to me, but essentially what that means is that in this case we have the Spitfires in Squadron A who are not part of the wing, but they are on the same radio net. All of the Allied planes are on radio net A. If Squadron A, which is flying a bit ahead of the wing, if they successfully tally one of these Italian squadrons, they can call back to the wing on the radio and then the wing leader can assign tallies to these squadrons in the wing based on what squadron A has seen. That also means that they can tally any of the planes that are in the same formation as that specific tallied squadron. So if A tallies squadron G here, because all these other planes are flying in formation with it, that means that the other three squadrons in the wing can suddenly tally squadrons X, Y, and Z for free without having to roll. As long as they're closer than 10 squares away from it, which they will be, then they've just got free tallies on everything. So the wings can be quite powerful in that sense that you know suddenly they can just give people tallies for free. But as long as somebody on the same radio net has tally the target, that can happen. If the wing leader themselves, if they tally a target, then the wing breaks up. But before they break up, the wing leader can still give orders. So if the wing leader was the one that tallied Squadron G, then he'd go, okay, Squadron D, you can grab Z. Squadron M, you can grab Y. And then that's all the tallies allocated and away they go. They are no longer a wing anymore. They're just separate squadrons now but they've got their targets and that's it so a wing is a thing that really only exists at the beginning of a scenario and it sort of dissipates once anyone's tallied anything so in this case as well because squadron a up here is not actually part of the wing but is on the same radio net it would be better for them to get the successful tally because they have a tally on a target, and then the wing leader can allocate tallies to themselves and the two other squadrons, so they'll all have tallies. Whereas if one of the wing squadrons actually gets the tally, then they won't be able to give that to squadron A up here, because they're not part of the wing. Now the thing with tactical flexibility is that when a squadron with tactical flexibility tallies a target, they have the option then of splitting in two. And this is why, if we have a look here, this is why I've got these counters up here. So these are actually flights of Spitfires. They're a different color scheme because there isn't enough of the brown ones in the selection to use. It basically means that this split fire, split fire, this Spitfire squadron can split into two smaller flights. Remember, a flight is essentially half a squadron. It will break up into two groups of six planes. One group will keep the tally, and the other group will continue on its intercept mission. And they can get a tally independently at a later stage. But it means that they're a bit more versatile but they're also a bit weaker separately because, of course, we've seen already that flights have a minus one penalty on their combat ratings at the very least. So they can attack more targets, but they're a bit more fragile in the process. But we could use that to our advantage here because what I am hoping is that Squadron A will tally the Italian formation. Then Squadron A can split and tally Squadron G and then the other flight can hopefully tally Squadron F back here, and then that's the escorts that are going to be tied up by the Spitfires, and then the wing behind them has now got tallies on X, Y, and Z, 
who are the transports, who are the ones they want to shoot down, really. So that's the plan. Whether this actually happens or not remains to be seen. Of course, it depends on the dice and so on. Now, the one thing that this does not have is that normally a wing leader can order a squadron in the wing to split as if it had tactical flexibility, even if it didn't actually explicitly have that in the scenario. In this specific scenario, though, the squadrons in the wing cannot be split by the wing leader. It's just a special rule in this scenario. But ordinarily, they could be. So in the first turn, I can tell you that nothing is going to happen apart from movement because everyone is too far away to tally anybody. So I'm just going to get going now and we'll carry on off camera until something interesting happens. So here we are at the start of turn two. So as I said, nothing super exciting is going to happen in turn one everyone just moves forward now we're at the point where tallies are possible the raiders are the italians so they theoretically have the option of tallying first they're not going to though the reason that they're not going to is these are set up as escorts. So if they were intercepts or sweeps, then yes, they would be making tally rolls. But they have a specific job to do as escorts, which is to protect the bombers or the transports in this case. They don't want to go flying off and engaging other people. They want other people to come to them so that they can get in the way. So they're not going to make any tally rolls. They're just going to, you know, sit and wait for something to happen. Squadron A here, the Spitfires, however, are most definitely going to be attempting to tally. Now, remember, the plan was for the Spitfires to try and tally Squadron G. And then they can use their tactical flexibility to split up into two squadrons. And then if they are successful, they can radio back to the wing and say hey they're over here and then the wing can get their tallies so the distance to the target is three we need to roll four or more we have a plus two to the roll because the target is in a formation of three or more squadrons and a line of sight exists to at least three squadrons in the formation there is no radio call so unlike the previous scenario nobody is on gci here once they get to their intercept vectors, if they haven't actually spotted anyone, then the squadrons are going to have to circle there because they can't get their vectors reassigned by ground control anymore. But in this case, that may not matter. We've got plus two modifier. The A squadron is a veteran, so there's another plus one. And that's it. So it's a plus three modifier. And we are three squares away. So anything that we roll is going to be successful. We roll a 1, we'll get a result of 4, we've tallied them. So just for appearances, we roll a 5. So at this point, the Spitfires have successfully tallied a target, so they can now split the squadron. So what I'm going to do now is remove this, and I'm going to replace the A squadron with two flights. So... Let's go over the changes here. Squadron A has now become two flights. They are O and P. Flight O is the one that retains the tally to MC202 Squadron G. The other flight does not keep a tally. Only one of the flights keeps a tally. So flight P is going to continue to the intercept vector here and will circle there if they don't manage to tally a target next turn, which hopefully they will be able to do. Meanwhile, they radioed back to the wing behind them, who are on the same radio net, and the wing leader there allocated tallies accordingly to the other squadrons in the wing, and they have decided to tally the bombers. So D... In the middle here has got the rear bomber squadron, E has got the middle one, and the flight at the top has got the flight at the front. So that's it. The wing has now served its purpose. 
these can all engage their targets independently. So that's a wing and tactical flexibility covered. And then we'll see how this goes and we'll see how escorts work when we get closer to the Italians.